I hope everyone's okay with that. And a warm welcome to all our participants this evening on this, the seventh day of Hanukkah. My name is Barbara Penchich and I'm a faculty member at the Toby Department of Jewish Studies at the University of Wrocław in Poland, in Wrocław. Our lecture this evening is the second event in our three-part online key questions open lecture series organized by the Toby department. All three lectures are being conducted by our faculty members and will cover the main topics, the three main topics of the curriculum of our new international MA program in Eastern European Jewish studies that is taught entirely in English and is launching, it's starting in the fall of 2024. The program, the curriculum of our program is made up of master classes and seminars that focus on three areas of Jewish life and experience in Eastern Europe. First of all is Hasidism that examines the history of a major popular mystical, Jewish popular mystical movement that sprang out of Eastern Europe and is now flourishing worldwide. The second track centers on Yiddish literature and society and culture rather in Eastern Europe. And we heard about that with Professor Karolina Szymaniak last Thursday. And the third track, which we'll be uh, hearing about today, examines the modern history of Polish Jews with a new perspective on accepted scholarly theses. Uh, before I begin though, I would like to introduce our Ukrainian partner, one of him, well, one of whom is here with us, the Interdisciplinary Certificate Program for Jewish Studies at the Krimsky Institute of Oriental Studies at the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Program Director Elena Zaslavskaya and her colleague Katarina Mahalova have generously, very generously agreed to conduct preliminary interviews with people from Ukraine who wish to study in the master's program in Eastern European Jewish studies. For more about that, please see the information that Lena is putting up on the chat. Thank you, Elena, especially big thanks, a big shout out to you for all your support and basically for coming up with the idea for doing these lecture series. Beautiful idea. And now to our main event. I am very delighted to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Kamil Kiek, Assistant Professor at the Toby Department of Jewish Studies. Professor Kiek is an historian and sociologist. He received his doctorate from the Institute of History at the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. In his doctoral dissertation, he studied patterns of socialization and the political consciousness of Jewish youth in interwar Poland. His research interests cover Jewish history in Eastern Central Europe in the second half of the 19th and 20th centuries, also relations between social theory, political, social, and cultural history, as well as the history of Zionism and the Jewish com community of Eretz Israel, Palestine in the 19th and 20th centuries. He is currently heading a major research project funded by the National Science Center entitled The Last Polish Shtetl, The Dzierżoniów Jewish Community, The Jewish World, The Cold War and Communism, 1945 to 1950. Professor Kiek is on the Academic Council of the research project Migration and Holocaust, Transnational Trajectories of Lubartów Jews Across the World, 1920s to 1950s, funded by the European Research Council program and conducted by the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. He is also the recipient of a scholarship from the Claims Conference Saul Kagan Fellowship in Advanced Shoah Studies. This evening, Professor Kiek will be speaking about the social history and Jewish Christian relations in the 20th century, key questions. Over the next 40 minutes or so, he will introduce us to the Jewish experience in Poland during the first five years directly after following World War II. Thank you. Kamil, the floor is yours. And if any of our participants have questions to our guest later, we will have a short 
Q&A session after the lecture. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much, Barbara, for the introduction. And uh, what I will present today will be the outline of one year series of seminars and lectures on Polish or Christian Jewish relations in 20th century. And at the same time, it is kind of a the theoretical and methodological basis or point of departure of two next books that, that I'm planning to write. And these books and this lecture will be not on a topic actually of the period just after the Second World War, after the Holocaust, 1945-1950, but more about the period that was before about the Holocaust and uh, Christian Jewish relations be, uh, before the Holocaust. And uh, as I want to speak shortly, and I very much would like to discuss a few things that I will, few problems that I will mention today in the discussion, there'll be no many dates or events in this lecture. I want to concentrate more about the social processes and their crucial impact on the Jewish-Christian relations uh, in Poland um, before and during the Holocaust. And my Poland, uh, my lecture will be mainly mm -hmm. about the Polish-Jewish relations because that's what I do. And that will be the main topic of the course. But uh, I will, in many moments, I will enter also into the dimension of Ukrainian-Jewish relations because it's obviously Ukrainian history is very much entangled with the Polish and Jewish one, and Jewish and Polish histories are, of course, very much in Eastern Europe, at least entangled with the Ukrainian history. And also, I want to underline that many of the things that I will say, not all, but many of them could be also referred to other places in, in East Central Europe to Soviet part of Belarus and Ukraine with all of the differences, but also to Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, uh, or, or Hungary. And the time frame of my lecture will be mainly 1918, just the end of the First World War, and 1950, let's say, or 1945, but more 1950, uh, first five years after the Holocaust, after the Second World War. But it's, of course, obvious that the history that we'll be speaking about today did not start in 1918 with the end of the First World War, and it did not end it in uh, uh, 1950. Also, please don't expect any far-reaching conclusions. You will just hear some ideas how to better understand what happened between Jews and Christians in the first half of the uh, 20th century, and, I, and as I believe, how to further proceed with the future research on Jewish-Christian uh, relations. And uh, just let me start with the first slide, but sorry, my computer has, yeah. The Mbashi, could you confirm that you see the slide? Yes, I do. Uh, okay. So, of course, or maybe not of course, but I think that we need to start kind of from the end, that is from the Holocaust, as it is obviously the most tragic moment of the Christian Jewish or Polish Jewish or Ukrainian Jewish relations in the first half of the 20th century. And uh, I want here to refer to the very famous book that is Bloodlands of Timothy Snyder, the book that most of you uh, probably know very well. Um, and the main, of, main point of this book, and with which I think there is no discussion, that the main perpetrator, the main spiritus movements uh, of the Holocaust was the Nazi German state. And the main context of the Holocaust was the genocidal total war that was between kind of two main regimes playing like players, regimes and players in this part of Europe that is uh, between the Nazi Germany uh, and Soviet Union. And uh, of course, what is a great value of this book, I think less for us in Eastern Europe, but more in the West, that really Snyder showed very different character of the Second World War uh, that took place in this part of Europe compared to the Western Europe and uh, that these territories were really bloodlands. You know, that something very different happened here during the Second World War that happened uh, in the West. And I think it's the great value of this book, despite some criticism that this book received, uh, including some criticism of my own that I will share with you uh, just uh, in a second. Um, again, this value that uh, Second World War in this part of Europe was much more genocidal, and uh, even more, that Holocaust needs to be understood 
in connection and in parallel with other genocide that uh, took part in this uh, place of Europe, starting with Holodomor and finishing of, on mass violence or mass murders in Volhynia, and even in early post-Second World War violence uh, in, in Poland and in Soviet Union, for example. Uh, but there is a one main problem with the Snyder's book that I think is connected to the core of the today's lecture. That is, as you will read the subtitle of the Bloodlands, Europe between Hitler and Stalin, the main explanation of the book is that whole dynamics of violence, of inter-ethnic violence that takes place in uh, uh, East Central Europe, Europe is the game between two totalitarian regimes, the game between Hitler uh, and Stalin. But what Steiner almost totally ignores is the transformations and the modernization, everything that they brought of all the nations and societies and ethnic groups that were living between Hitler and Stalin, uh, that all, um, they were also touched upon the processes that created the Nazi uh, or Soviet regimes, and that what happened during the very violent process of modernization to Poles, Slovaks, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, and finally the Jews. And I will speak today about that authoritarian political culture, political radicalization, the rising role of violence in politics. All this, of course, characterized also Polish, Slovak, Ukrainian, Lithuanian, Romanian, or uh, Jewish uh, experience. And this also should be understood and taken into account when we analyze what happened between, with, uh, between uh, representatives of this group during the Second uh, World War. Now, uh, the question is, if another school of people in, in, in that kind of also very strongly criticized um, Snyder for what, the, what they wrote is that it's kind of a relativization of the Holocaust. And I very much uh, um, disagree with this criticism that Snyder relativized the Holocaust. Um, so there is this amazing and very accomplished group of new critical historians in Poland and abroad that uh, you can call them under one name of you know New Polish School of Holocaust Research. And these are the people represented by Jan Tomasz Gross, Barbara Engelking, Jan Grabowski, Alina Skibinska, and many other people that showed in many of the, their works the participation in the Holocaust of so-called ordinary Poles, peasants, workers, members of intelligentsia, policemen, firefighters, and also members of Polish uh, anti Nazi resistance. And I want to really underline and to stress the amazing accomplishment that these people had also in thinking, like in change how the Polish society thinks and perceives uh, its history. And uh, they really strengthen the critical kind of historical awareness, not only of intellectuals, but also of uh, Polish society. The thing is that also this explanation of the Holocaust is not sufficient one and does not let us to understand really everything what happened during the Holocaust and uh, during the Second World War between Poles and, uh, and Jews. Um, because these books are written from the standpoint of analysis of antisemitism. Antisemitism, very strong antisemitism as the leading dominant factor that animated the attitude of the Polish society towards Jews that it came together with a specific dynamics of the genocidal dynamics of the Second World War. And all this um, affected, the effect of all of this was the, the participation of the some part of the Polish society um, in the Holocaust. Now this, as I said, this uh, explanation is uh, very important, but not the full one, not sufficient one. Because first of all, we kind of don't understand, still don't know what was the connection between the traditional peasant countryside antisemitism and the modern anti modern radical antisemitism that was dominant at the time in the city culture. But what was the connection between the between the two? We also don't understand how interwar radical politics and radical modern antisemitism was imported and penetrated Polish, Ukrainian, and other uh, countryside of Eastern Europe. Also, in these kind of explanations, 
Jews, uh, Jews are main objects of the historical reality, of historical process. They're only victims. There is no inclusion of the Jewish history into the study of Polish-Jewish um, relations. Uh, also, it is obvious that not only anti-Semitism, it was not only context of the Christian-Jewish uh, relation and estrangement in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, finally, we kind of need to discuss the other particular traits of East uh, Central European modernity and their crucial influence on Jewish Christian relations in the 20th century, before and um, during, uh, during the Holocaust. And the obvious kind of solution and the obvious kind of path to try to answer these questions is crossing the threshold of 1939 or 1941, because most of the histories of Polish-Jewish relations during the Holocaust start with the Holocaust. But of course, to understand what happened, we need to kind of look, uh, look before to cross this threshold of the Second World War and study uh, history uh, of Jewish-Christian relations um, in much wider kind of context, not only to the prism of antisemitism, not only to the prism of attitude of the majority towards the minority, but equally studying the social history uh, of the both groups. And that goal of the seminar and the lecture and also, you know, the, the future, I hope, research works that will come out of it is to go beyond, to cross this threshold of 1939 and to look at the history of uh, interwar Poland. Now, what is probably the most important that we could say, or we should say on interwar Poland and on the dynamics that the new Polish state kind of casted upon the Polish, Jewish, uh, Belarusian, uh, Ukrainian uh, mutual relations in the second Pol uh, Poland Republic. That second Pol uh, Pol Polish Republic using the famous definition of Rogers Brubaker, was a multi-ethnic, but also national or national, na nationalizing state. W what does it mean? It mean and it meant that despite that the Polish Second Republic had one third of its uh, citizens were not ethnically uh, national Poles, they were Jews, they were Ukrainians, Belarusians, Lithuanians, and Germans, uh, but that the state actually acted in the interest of one ethnic uh, Polish nation and kind of its cultural educational politics aimed or to assimilate one of the groups or to disempower or denationalize or at least kind of diminish the political and cultural potential of some other uh, national minorities. And it is especially, especially important, especially crucial for Jewish and from Ukrainian cases of Jewish and Ukrainian citizens um, of the Second Polish Republic. And actually this politics of Polish state uh, had the effect very contrary to the one that, uh, to, the, to, to its goals. Because one of the most fascinating, uh, fascinating features of it is the universal education that was introduced in the interwar Polish state that included also the discrimination or even sometimes harassment of the private education, private schooling of minorities. And what happened to Ukrainian and to Jewish private schooling in interwar Poland is again the perfect example of this uh, discrimination. Uh, and all this caused most of the uh, Jewish and Ukrainian actually youth and kids to study in Polish state schools, whether they, they were like um, Polish schools, whether they were, you know, special so-called utraquistic uh, state schools um, created for Ukrainians or so-called Shabasówki created for the Jews. All these schools uh, really taught along the program of passing the superiority, the domination of the uh, Polish culture. And as I did in my, my uh, first book that Barbara mentioned, analyzing the Jewish experience in Polish schools, actually really um, Polish Jews internalized the symbols of Polish national culture, the, you know, the symbols of Polish um, literature, but contrary to the goals of the uh, Polish state, that also, uh, they also internalize the feeling of exclusion, the feeling that, you know, they're taught to love Poland, but they will uh, never be uh, equal citizens of Poland. Also, they receive this strong feeling that their, their own culture, their own Jewish culture is kind of a lower, it's inferior 
um, towards Polish culture, and all this caused a very strong feeling of resentment, and actually even strengthened the national feelings of the uh, Jewish youth. And actually, if you could, if you would read the, some of you read the fascinating new book of Jarosław Krycak, uh, that is his global history of Ukraine, he notes there that the kind of experience and the effect of the Polish state schooling, schooling on the Ukrainian youth was very much uh, similar. That also it caused feeling of jealousy and immunity, resentment, and kind of a need of creating, uh, you know, of developing a national movement, national co uh, culture of their own that would match the, you know, the, the dominant uh, Polish culture that was kind of inculcated, inflicted uh, on them. This effect is, of course, also combined in second and the Polish Republic, or it's interacting very strongly in 29, uh, and general, the state of peripheral modernization, which is characterizing this uh, part of Europe. What I mean by the peripheral modernization? Uh, peripheral modernization is this kind of a phenomenon in which general cultural modernization of the next generation goes very fast and it kind of in many ways matches what is happening in the Western Europe or in the so-called West. There is a very dynamic development of mass culture and mass media. There is a very strong impact of the new culture and the, and the universal education on the youngest generations. They have much higher social awareness than their parents. And most of all, they have much more higher social ambitions than their parents and grandparents. At the same time, they are living, especially if they are representatives of the minorities, but also, for example, if they are Polish peasants, they are living in a state that is very strongly discriminated, discriminating them, also in a state that is fighting the very deep consequences of 1920, uh, 1929 world economic crisis, that especially in the Central Eastern, that hit especially hard is Central Europe, and, and that in a situation in which East Central Europe kind of comes out of the crisis in much lower pace than, for example, Germany did, or France, or even the United States of America, also in the states that are much more agricultural economies, meaning that for children and grandchildren of the peasants, it's very hard to fulfill the, the, these higher uh, social ambitions that they have and that they gain by this modernization process, but the process of the uh, cultural modernization. So there is this kind of phenomenon in which young generation has a much higher ambitions than their social parents. And everything what, the, uh, what this young generation sees seems around is a confirmation that actually it's almost impossible for them to climb on the social radar, that it's impossible to fulfill these ambitions. This phenomenon comes with interaction with another one that is again a universal European phenomenon. This is the phenomenon that I and many other uh, scholars call radical modernism, that is the um, general cultural politi and political crisis of interwar uh, period, the downfall of belief in democracy and in liberal politics, and especially, um, like in whole Europe, also the rise of uh, uh, political radicalisms that very much transforms the uh, political uh, culture. And uh, this new kind of aggressive ideologies of far right and far left that enter the center of the European political discourse, they both promise the radical social, national or national and social transformation of the surrounding reality. They promise the destruction of the old world and, and radical kind of creation of a much better new, new world. And uh, you can find these visions in many radical political visions, in communism, in radical socialism, in fascism on, uh, or integral nationalism. And this is the main kind of the the main context in which we see the rise of these radical uh, movements, like, for example, uh, young, so-called young, radical fascist leaning faction of a Polish uh, nationalist movement of Polish Andetsia. This is the same phenomenon that characterizes the rise of own and uh, 
the fact that all oh, that is the Ukrainian radical nationalists, they kind of, you know, supplement the UNDO, the liberal nationalist movement of uh, Ukrainians. From the other side, this is the rise of Communist Party of Poland or uh, Communist Party of Western Ukraine, but it's also the rise of Bundeszunkunft, uh, of radical uh, left Zionism, and on the other side, the right wing or even far right wing revision Zionism in case of uh, Jews. All these people, all this young generation characterized by this uh, new radical politics is uh, um, characterized by, uh, by much bigger readiness for violence, but by much bigger readiness to defend their national honor, uh, by much more radical ideas of solutions, uh, finding solutions to their own life, and also to find the radical solutions towards national conflicts between Poles, Jews, Ukrainians, and on other conflicts that characterize the society of the Second Polish Republic. And altogether, we have a very interesting, but also I would say very dangerous and deadly phenomenon that we have the generations of the young people in the Second Polish Republic, that they were never so culturally close to one another. That It means that never young Jews, young Poles, young Ukrainians, but again also Belarusians, Lithuanians and Germans, did not share so many of the cultural traits between one another. They never even, you know, in terms of literature that they read, languages that they could speak or at least understand, they were never so close to one another, but at the, at the very same time, they were never so much ready for the mutual violence uh, in between them. And of course, one another context of this situation is that uh, I especially mentioned at the end, not at the beginning, is the another very strong phenomen phenomenon characterizing not only Poland, but the whole Europe in the between the wars, that is the development of radical modern uh, antisemitism. And uh, of course, radical antisemitism is very much, and its development is very much characterizing the, um, the situation of interwar uh, Poland. And uh, we could speak a lot about its you know, different elements, but I think that all of us may agree that uh, what characterizes all these kind of streams of radical antisemitism is that they make Jews as one of the main reasons why the modernity looks pathological, why, why the modern world is not like it was supposed to be. So Jews in all these ideologies, uh, ideologies are made one of the main reasons of all of the calamities uh, of modern world. And of course, Jews, guilty, Jews are guilty for communism, but from the other side, they're made guilty for soulless capitalism. Of course, Jews are guilty of the great world crisis. In general, they're guilty of moral and physical uh, degeneration of uh, Europe. And of course, these ideas were, were, were not born after 1918. They were born in the end of 19 and in the beginning of 20th century. But what, what is very important to say that all these elements or this context that I mentioned before um, provide the perfect ground for the development, very dynamic development of these ideas in the interwar period. And uh, that uh, exactly happened. Also, the, described, uh, the context that I have uh, described makes a perfect situation for the urban elites, urban radical national elites, to promote these ideas in the countryside, among the lower uh, strata of society. And one of the paradoxes uh, of the time is what made this popularization of city radical and um, semic culture, uh, semitic culture on the countryside possible. What made it possible? The cultural modernization that I, uh, that I mentioned, the universal education, and the fact that for the first time in the history of this part of Europe, the younger strata of society, all of its representatives could read, could write, and, and could understand the um, modern political ideologies, including the ideology of uh, radical antisemitism. And you can see it really in the propaganda agitation and political co educational content of activity of own that is of the Ukrainian radical nationalists, but you can see it also in the activity of ONR, that is Polish fascist, or a young stream of Andesia, national uh, democratic movement. And myself, I did a research on a pogrom and on 
what they call the socio-technique of violence, the tendency the Polish right wing did in the central Poland in the Kielce Wojewodzki uh, uh, province. And uh, you could really see how in the first half of 1930s, uh, these ideas really kind of hold ground. That is, they, they really affect the, the considerable part of the peasant society. But of course, situation is, or story is much more complicated. First of all, not all peasants were in, uh, affected by these um, ideas. Second of all, contrary what was written in the in the literature, um, historical uh, literature so far, uh, that it were not peasants as themselves who, who, who were perpetrators of anti-Jewish violence, of pogrom in Przytyk or pogrom in Brzeź that you can see here on the, on the picture, but actually there were the peasant new peasant members of the national movement. So uh, another feature of, of this uh, whole story is the fact that also other Christians, other Poles were victims of these nationalists, the, 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 that there were Poles attacked who still uh, came with the interaction with the Jews, they were attacked by the Polish nationalists and they were also peasants, they were also Christians, yes? So, so all this shows that the situation was uh, very much complex. Also, one another fact, that is not taken so far until now so, so often under consideration when we analyze the Christian-Jewish relations in Poland, also in other places, is also uh, not only that the traditional or modern Christian societies have a very strong stereotypes against the Jews, but also that there is a very strong stereotypization of the Christian society represented by the traditional Jewish milieus. And uh, you can really see, if you look deeply into the Jewish sources, that uh, you know that among the next to the love of Polish urban culture and even Polish patriotism, there is a very strong enmity towards Polish uh, lower classes or Ukrainian lower classes, towards the peasants, towards the workers, generally towards the people who who who, um, who live from the manual uh, labor, and all these things needed to be we need to take um, under consideration and to analyze really deeply looking into the autobiographical documents uh, to the sources in polish ukrainian hebrew and yiddish to official polish government sources but also to jewish and other personal documents to understand the complicity and the complication of all of these uh, relations and uh, to sum up all this, what I have tried very shortly to, to describe, kind of creates a very dangerous dynamics in 1930s, which when will be, and these dynamics in a moment when it will be uh, confronted with the genocidal conditions of the Second World War and what Nazi and Soviet occupation does on this territory, there is kind of, will very much influence this chain of violence that um, took place uh, in these territories, and referring to one another book that I will just in uh, in in three minutes I will discuss uh, the very famous book of Omar Bartov on uh, on Buchach, on Ukrainian Buchach, uh, It is very important to know that all these phenomena that I described they did not happen in a situation when these communities, Christian and Jewish communities, lived in a total separation from one another because they really lived. These people lived. Next, next to each other, they were neighbors. They were kind of integrated in this strange traditional way. And all these phenomena that, uh, that I have described made this future violence especially deadly because it will be this, what other scholars call intimate violence, really violence between people who are very well um, inter integrated. And now to really understand what happened uh, between these people, as I said, we need to go beyond the, this general history that I have described, this political um, history that was also described in the book of uh, Omer Bartov, and go into the micro-social history. And we can here really use the very interesting phenomenon that was characterizing interwar period, that is the development of the autobiographical writings, that one of the main features of sociology, of interwar sociology, what uh, was a very big concentration on the usage of the autobiographies or 
or uh, on the personal documents who uh, were written by the so-called uh, simple people. And um, we should use these documents of the social life of the interwar period re written by the anonymous people to really analyze all these dynamics, kind of general dynamics that I uh, described so far. And also, uh, we have also another amazing advantage that is the opportunities that are provided by the digital, uh, digital humanities. To give you the example, like working on this Przytyk pogrom on the uh, anti-Jewish violence only in one area of Poland in 1930s, I could create a database of around 7,000 people who in different were victims, perpetrators, or kind of, you know, people sometimes being the, uh, taking part in the events um, um, that, that, that I was describing. And using the tools of digital humanities, we can really trace what happened with these people also during the war with many of these people. And in this way, by, combining the general history with the micro social history kind of really provide a very deep and um, uh, social history of the Jewish Christian relations before and during the Second World War and kind of drag this history, kind of go with this history beyond 1939. And in the case of the same people studied um, during the Holocaust. And this actually attempt was made by uh, Omer Bartov that I mentioned before and his um, fascinating, amazing book that was published in English, but also in Hebrew, in Polish and in Ukrainian, that is Anatomy of a Genocide, the Life and Death of, the, of a Town Called Buczacz. And um, this is an amazing book and it has amazing qualities, um, but the problem of this book is that it really, in a fascinating way, describes the political dynamics of inter Polish Republic and how much it kind of poisons the Polish-Jewish-Ukrainian relations. But when this book enters the Second World War, it is using very another set of sources, mainly the German sources that Omer Bartov is expert in, uh, he's an expert on them. And so it is the, so these are the, like on the inter period, he, it uses Polish mainly government, some memoirs of and some Ukrainian Jewish sources, but entering the Second World War, it uses mainly the sources of Nazi occupation authorities that, that mainly show the Nazi state kind of policy of the Holocaust, but, but not the social relations of the same people that were described in the first chapter of the book. And what I have described today and what, what will be the goal, uh, goal of the seminar that will be running at, the, uh, at our ME program in Jewish studies is what would what be to trace the, the kind of micro, this general context, but also the micro uh, histories of the same people before and during the Holocaust in order to answer some of these questions that I uh, posed, that I gave uh, before. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And to sum up, uh, what I tried to tell you today is that uh, in order to really understand the dynamics of Jewish Christian relations during the Holocaust, we need to uh, go into the longer durée social history and cross the threshold of 1939 and look at least uh, at the interwar uh, period. Uh, period. And we and these studies need to contain from one side the grand scale analysis of the major social processes, together with these macro histories of the particular people and particular small places. And again, to cut between the interwar period and the second world war period. And that is what we will kind of intend to do uh, during our um, uh, MA, uh, MA program. And just to finish with something I would say more optimistic, uh, not to finish only these bad, bad aspects of the Christian-Jewish relations that uh, we discussed uh, so far, I want to finish with uh, two stories. One is the story of the family of Superuniuk that I encountered uh, during my work, um, current work that Barbara mentioned on the post-war, post-Holocaust history of Polish Jews. This is the Ukrainian um, family from the Lublin area that was 
before the action Vistula, Vistula uh, before the deportation of the Ukrainians from early communist Poland in 1947, it was a mixed Polish, Jewish, Ukrainian uh, territory. And this is the marriage of Konstant and Maria Supruniuk, who during the war hidden their neighbors, uh, neighbors turbiners, so-called Dorfiden, that is the uh, peasant Jews who were their members and, and kind of uh, acquaintances before the war. They were hiding them under their barn to, throughout all of the Holocaust period. Now, the tragedy of the family of uh, Supruniuk is the fact that their daughter, and their son-in-law, as a young Ukrainians who grew up in these very heavy discriminatory, uh, discriminatory conditions of inter Poland, they were affected by the ideology of Oun, and there was a fight between Konstant and Maria and their children uh, regarding whether the parents really should risk their lives and the lives of their family to, to hide these Jewish families, and even the son-in-law threatened them that he will expose them to the... Uh, to the German authorities. He never did it, but the fact is that there was a rift between parents and their daughter after the war. And uh, Turbiners, the, the Jews who were saved by the Supruniuks, kind of readopted their saviors and took them to Lower Silesia, to Poland, when they started the new life here in Western Poland. And the daughter of Supruniuks was with her husband and their young small daughter were deported to Soviet Ukraine in uh, 1947. Now the optimistic story is that the grandchildren, the the uh, granddaughter of Supruniuk found Shlomo Turbiner, uh, one of these uh, small boys who were saved by Supruniuks under their barn. Um, she found them in the beginning of end of eighties or beginning of nineties. Uh, in uh, in Israel, and they kind of reunited uh, here in Poland, I think 20 years ago. And Shlomo Sopronik today was very much also supportive for, you know, uh, supporting Ukrainian volunteers and Polish volunteers who were actually also traveling to Kiev and supporting, you know, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, efforts to, to fight with the Rus uh, Russian aggression. And uh, what I actually try to say today, that the tragedy of this story could be really fully understood if we go beyond the, the Holocaust, we really understand the conditions of the interwar period and all, all, all these you know, tragic processes that took place, if we'll be empathic to all the sides, if we will not from the one side relativize or ignore the issue of anti-Semitism, but also understand the all other crucial factories defining the social histories of Jews and Christians um, in this uh, part of Europe. So that's all. Uh, I am very you know, open for your questions. I can also add that actually I nie rozmawiają po ukraińskie, but my mom is from Odessa, so I can answer also in the Odessian Surzyk. Uh, I can read Ukrainian, I can understand Ukrainian. So if you are, you know, you are afraid to ask in English, I can answer the questions which will be given in Ukrainian uh, also. So thank you very much. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Kiek. Thank you very much. Let's open the floor now for participants. I think I have given everyone permission to speak. I hope. If not, uh, please write in the chat or let me know if you have a question. Mm, let me see if I have anybody, anyone at all. Let's see, people, anybody have something to Professor Kiek this, this evening? Let me see if I can just uh, unmute everyone. I think I have. So if anyone has a question, I think that they can. I, ask. I have enabled. Um, yes. I have enabled um, the the muting, so anyone can unmute himself or herself and ask the question. Yes. Please. There was a lot there to think about and to digest. It's a very complicated subject, um, but I think there has been as. Professor Kiek says there have been new there has been a lot of new thinking, especially after 89 
in Poland for obvious reasons. And if there are no questions from our audience this evening, I just thought I'd put something out there for you, Kamil, if you, if you have some thoughts about the level or the sort of the, the depth or the quality of Jewish expectations and participation in Polish life on all levels after 1920, after Poland became independent. And how do you see that changing? Oh, you know, up until the moment of the Holocaust. You mean like, okay. What did they see for themselves, you know, when as a group or it's always so hard to generalize. Yeah, that's that, that's that's for sure. That's the main thing yeah. that you cannot yeah. uh, speak about uh, one the Jews, yeah, attitude the Jews. towards the Polish state. First right. of all, you need to say that uh, for most of the Jews, as for most of the non-Polish non-Jews, it was a totally new unexpected phenomenon. And uh, it was totally new reality that no, nobody, and you can like look from Novogrudek, from Vilnius, from Lithuania, up to, you know, uh, Southern Ukraine, like, you know, Southern parts of the uh, uh, Eastern Galicia. Nobody, you know, for, it, it was a very new state. Now in Galicia, of course, there was a Polish autonomy in the Hasbrook time, but meaning that for many of the Jews, as uh, other non-Polish, non-Jews, it was a totally foreign state and they, they had to learn this state from a new. It was a totally new reality. There was a minority of the group uh, of the Polish Jews who, uh, who were very strongly acculturated or defined themselves as a Poles of mosaic faith, but it was a minority group. Most of the Jews, both on Ukrainian and Polish ethnic or uh, especially Lithuanian and ethnic Belarusian territories, mostly thought about themselves in orthodox or national categories and they wanted kind of to be uh, equal citizens of the Polish state, they want to be a good patriots of the Polish state at the same time with their national rights being respected and also their collective culture and national rights or even national autonomy and what, what needs to be what it needs to be underlined that expectations of all of these groups were not matched by the Polish state. And of course, one cannot blame only the, you know, uh, it's there is no explanations, simple explanation why these expectations were not met. It was a very uh, hard situation of this, you know, radical nationalism defining um, uh, all the national uh, groups. Uh, but, 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 but the fact is that these expectations were not met. And the same is actually, it's very similar regarding the Ukrainians, that if you look at the Ukrainian national movement that fought with Polish national movement just after the First World War, but then after the Ukrainians lost to Polish and to, to Poles and to Bolsheviks because they could not win in this um historic, uh, historical circumstances and when the western uh, ukrainian republic and ukrainian social republic felt in, um, in kiev and, and in lviv down the ukrainian national democratic party the undo was a legal party they tried to act legally to be a legal good party that would not break the polish law but uh, you know the they were not kind of their activity was not welcomed by the state and state helped, uh, helped the radical nationalists to beat the liberals. And, you know, so... Uh, but again, this process of political radicalization that kind of affected the Polish state and caused them to fall into author uh, authoritarianism also kind of affected the minorities, the stateless minorities who were also, you know, evolving in these radical directions. So... At the end of the day, 1930s, there were really no conditions for reapproachment of mutual understanding, empathy, and you know, uh, kind of uh, unloading all these uh, conflicts. And and that is actually the luxury of our times. That we uh, the luxury of our times is that we can empathically study this, um, and this understand and not judge these people, kind of you know and. Uh, mm -hmm. And also do by doing that unload some of the historical propaganda that is made by the current authoritarian regimes, and I hear mean mainly think about the Russia, how they use this complicated history in order, you know, to support their own politics today. Now the, the, the only thing to do 
to kind of unload the dangerous potential of this is to study this sympathically. And that's what we try to do actually also in our program. Exactly. I don't, I hope I'm not ignoring or missing anyone who might have had a question. Uh, I have a question. Oh, please, Lena, please go ahead. Um... Если Камиль, можно на русском не будет сложно? Конечно, да, да. Но я не знаю, я отвечу на английский, потому что много. Конечно, слов. да, да. У меня вопрос по поводу вчерашнего инцидента в с польском сейме ага. загашенной минурой. Угу. Есть ли какие-то комментарии по этому поводу и как вообще отреагировало общество? Что можно сказать? Спасибо. Okay, so the question was about the event that happened um, um, yesterday in Polish Parliament that one of the most radical um, right-wing MPs, members of Parliament, took the fire extinguisher and in the middle of the Parliament, just in between the sessions, in the presence of hundreds of people, extinguished the Hanukkah and also attacked the one of the women that uh, tried to stop him. The question was, what was the reaction of the Polish society? what were the reactions of the politicians. So official political reaction is the condemnation of everybody, including even the members of the party of uh, Brown, of uh, Grzegorz Brown, the, the, the person who, who did that. And uh, I haven't seen public opinion polls, but, uh, but uh, most of the society, I think, condemned this behavior. Nevertheless, I think that there are a few kind of not noticed and very dangerous phenomena who actually are connected to what we have discussed today, who, are, who are, so far were not discussed. What Brown did actually after he did this with the Hanukkah, that attacked the Hanukkah, he went to the Polish Mufnica, like the he went to speak in the parliament and said that he attacked the satanic Talmudic and pagan symbol and racist symbol, which uh, Hanuki, according to him, was, and what actually he did, and he called for for his, you know, he called um, the other people who accused him of, you know, of racist act, uh, he called them for ethological debate, as he called it. What he did actually is exactly what happened in Poland in 1936, when after Przytyk Pogrom, the right wing who tried to defend the pogromers, uh, mm, called for a debate between the liberals and the Reverend Stanislav Trzeciak, who was the, actually wrote many books about, you know, how satanic uh, Talmudic Jews are, you know, attacking the Christian culture. And actually what Brown was speaking yesterday in the parliament, he was referring to, to the book of Trzeciak. So, and, um, and, and really Brown, he's not some uh, like crazy weird guy as he's sometimes described in the media. He's a very conscious person, very intelligent, very uh, 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 red person. He, as many other representatives of Polish right wing, really read their history. Uh, they really read the radical right wing sources from Interpoland. They really understand what they did. Uh, the radical right wing was during the war and before the war. And kind of they are referring to it today. The problem of the liberal commentator is that they don't study this history. They don't understand that there is this kind of deep heritage in part of Polish, in, not in all, but in part of Polish political culture. Uh, and because there is this amnesia, these kind of elements all the time kind of can uh, repeat itself. And of course, one other context is of Brown's activity, that he has some connections to the to the Russian state, as many of the representatives of the radical right wing. And, you know, it serves an uh, obvious ge geopolitical goal today. And one other thing is that he's not alone. If you look at the Polish internet, reactions on the internet, you can see that his act found many supporters. So answering your question, most of the society condemns this act. Most of the politicians are condemning it. But there are some politicians who cynically use use his behavior for their own purposes. And there is a part of society that kind of openly or hiddenly supports the activity of Brown because some of these demons of, I would say, the radical modernism and radical antisemitism are still in Polish society. They were and they will be probably for next years to come. Thank you. I think- Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. I think uh, somebody's 
Somebody has a hand uh, up? Yeah, go ahead. Me. Go ahead. Sophia please. Quorum. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Uh, you talked about that thing. Thank you very much for the lecture. I'm like, I'm interested in that more than in any other things. But uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned that a little bit. Uh, can you talk more about the attitude of uh, Jews to uh, non-Jews and more specifically to Poles and Ukrainians uh, before uh, violence started? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question, great topic. And uh, if you're interested in the topic, you probably noticed that there is not so much literature about this. There is a great book of Rosa Lenman, uh, Symbiosis, and, uh, Symbiosis and Ambivalence. It's actually the book about the, also, you know, one of the shtetls uh, in, uh, in Galicia, very interesting one, kind of anthropological approach. But uh, Really, we need much more studies to fully answer your question. But what I did actually so far is that I I, wor I was working on these autobiographies of Jewish youth uh, from 1930s, from very different milieus, from orthodox to secular, from uh, right uh, radical left wing to radical right wing, and uh, of this generation that it was the again first generation that entered the universal state education, and for the first time encountered also Poles and Ukrainians, uh, also from peasant milieus, uh, as their classmates. And now, uh, of course, these relations are very complex, but uh, there is no doubt that besides the fact that some of these people really establish good relations or even friendships, and besides the fact that there is this development of radical ideologies, of radical hatred that affects these young people, Besides that, the, the, these um, people inherit some of the stereotypes from the traditional societies in which they are growing up. And for, for example, in terms of Jews, most common feature is admiration to the Polish high culture, admiration you know, to what they see in the movies, in the theater, to the high culture of the Polish cities. But then there is a, also kind of a looking from above onto the, these poor primitive peasants whether they're Polish or Ukrainian ones, uh, ones, and it kind of it's a long durée inheritance of also of kind of a social behavior and I would say social lenses of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, yes, of the place of the Jews uh, in these societies, and at the same time, uh, the young Poles and Ukrainians also inherit some of these traditional social lenses in which they perceive the Jews. And if they're peasants, if they grew up in villages in the traditional societies, they have this, what uh, Yaroslav Hrycak actually mentioned before, describes of this kind of basic kind of uh, feature of looking on the on, on surrounding society as this, you know, righteous people who work on the, with the agriculture on the countryside and then who are connected to this, you know, foreign urban culture and the uh, ultimate symbols of those aliens are, of course, Jews also from the religious reasons. As I said, school and all the new context of the modern relations that are created by the 20th, 20th century unloads some of these stereotypes, or at least creates a new kind of venues of interaction between, uh, between these young people that make that kind of make these stereotypes weaker. From the other side, there is a very strong peer modern national nationalist peer pressure on these relations. And in these autobiographies that I found, or written from the Jewish perspectives, but I'm very sure if I would read, and I will do it in the future, if I would read Ukrainian and Polish autobiographies, I would find the same. There was a very strong peer pressure on some young Jews not to so much fraternize with uh, Polish or Ukrainian youth. For example, they were very, I found in many, auto, in few, not many, but in few autobiographies, the moments when some Jewish girl starts to go out with some Polish boy, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian uh, boy, and she's, or he's, if, if it's a boy, attacked or, you know, pressured by, by his peers. 
uh, also from the same point of view of ideology of modern nationalism that you shouldn't you know fraten uh, fraternize not with your own own or fraten fraternize with the enemies or with the nation that its representatives are attacking you and that the whole problem the whole tragedy of modern polish state is that instead of unloading this kind of differences, it kind of strengthens them in a modern way. Because it is very much, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, nationalist oriented, and it kind of very much strengthens these national divisions. So to sum up my very preliminary answer, these relations were sometimes very good. Very often they were based on a very strong common stereotype, uh, stereotypes. The problem of the interwar modernity is that it marked that it very much alienated these young people who were culturally close to one another as never before and that's the kind of reality in which this generation entered the, the second world war and it caused one of the you know social dynamics uh, very important social dynamics of the holocaust taking place in polish or ukrainian belarusian or lithuanian areas Thank you, Professor Kiek. Thank you I think thank you for your question, everyone. I think it's time to wrap up. As everyone can see and hear from Professor Kiek's sh very short introduction today, there's so much more there. And we really want to encourage you to join us and to continue the dialogue, to continue the discussion with Professor Kiek and his colleagues at the university and at the department. Uh, by joining us uh, through at the MA program next fall. I would encourage our Ukrainian listeners to be in touch with Elena Zaslavskaya at the Certificate Program for Jewish Studies, the Interdisciplinary Certificate Program. Other people, uh, other listeners not from UK, Ukraine, please do contact me either at EEJS, the, at either of the uh, email addresses I provided or check out our website. There's many different ways you can get in touch with us and I hope you do. And next, and I invite everyone to next week's lecture on Hasidism, which will be held by Professor Marcin Wojcicki in one week exactly at 6 p.m. also at the same link. So again, thank you for your invaluable participation. Obviously, discussion and dialogue need two parties. Professor Kamil Kiek speaking with Professor Kamil Kiek would be a very sterile exercise. So I want to thank everyone for being here and giving us your time and energy and attention. Good night and be safe, everyone, please. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.